Welcome back for another book review. Today we are talking about this one. So this is Spells for a Magical Year, 100 Rituals and Enchantments for Prosperity, Power, and Fortune. And this is by Sarah Barlett, I feel like is how that's supposed to be pronounced. I could be wrong. So this is a fairly large book. It has the same like dimensions as a lot of the like hardback of like a cookbook. Like it's about that size. If you've ever gotten like the, oh, we've got I think World of Warcraft, uh, Skyrim. I think we have like a couple of like the unofficial of like Disney and like Harry Potter and whatever. Those kinds of cookbooks, it's kind of like that size. The pages in here are very pretty. It's got this kind of stained look and like it feels like it's supposed to try to be kind of a printed edition of like a book of shadows which is really fun. The premise of this book is that it goes through each month and it gives you different things to focus on. Every month pretty much has a new and full moon ritual and then whatever like sacred days there are, any festivals, wheel of the year, changing of the zodiac, all of that stuff is always included. Which you think that would be great! But no, there's a reason this has such a low lip rating for me because it was awful. So I gave this one a 2 out of 5. It was really not good. So you th you get sucked in with the pretty of the pages and the size of the book and you're like, ooh, maybe it'll be good. And then no. Pretty much the entire time that I was reading this, I had a consistent kind of theme a lot of times and that was like, consent, who's she? That's just, every time I was reading this book, that just is what came up all the time. And the author doesn't really state that they are Wiccan, but it's like heavily encouraging you to like just take it and just throw that into a little ball and just toss it. Because why would we do that? Why would we want consent from potential partners, romantic, hookups, whatever. Like there was a lot of that. There was a lot that the research felt iffy and there's no bibliography so I cannot confirm. <laughs> like where did you get this information from? Because a lot of this was like I don't know, but we'll get into specifics in a little bit, but as a brief, I was very like questioning on just how much of this information the author was able to like get. And again, without a bibliography, like where are you getting your stuff? Is it just Google? Because like sometimes Google isn't your best friend when researching spiritual beliefs. The intended audience for this book, I think from the author's side, like who they intended this book to be for, it's kind of more of like the trendy witches, but who should actually probably be reading this book? If you are like mildly intrigued and willing to do a lot more research, it can give you ideas of where to start because there is a lot of different cultures that are used in this book. It does, to me, it felt very heavy on like the Greek side, but there was a unhealthy rotation between others as well, but I feel like Greek was like the top most common and then the others kind of got divided up. You had some Wiccan, because of course, <laughs> but then you also had like Shinto and Hindu and a little bit of Norse and some like Christian and like saints and then you had just like again the zodiacs. There was a lot but if you are like I don't know what I want to research this will give you a lot of options of things to go look up further. And that's about as good as I can say for this book. So let's get on to some of the specifics. So these are just going to be some of the concerning lines and things that annoyed me from this book because there was a lot of them. So page 62, food has no power over me from a weight loss spell. No, um, if food doesn't have power over you, you're probably dead. That's how living works. Like, I get the sentiment, I don't agree with it, but like, no, <laughs> it's, such a, it's such a dumb line because food will always have power over you. That's how your body is designed to work. And also to me is like showing that you have a very unhealthy relationship with food. And really, it's a common theme in this book. I think the author just needs therapy because <laughs> there was a lot of this book that I'm like, girl, your shadow's showing. Get some help. Because there was a lot of like weight loss stuff and I'm like, honey, you can be okay at any size. Focus on health, not on the scale. And not even necessarily how you look because inner beauty, it's so cliche, but it's so true, comes from your own inner happiness. 
you can be gorgeous and like your personality peeks through and all of that outer beauty is gone. It doesn't matter. Like if, and then there's people that like at first glance, they might not look very pleasing and then their personality just shines through and you're like, oh my God, you're actually a beautiful person. Like inner beauty, way more important than outer beauty. But like in particular, that line was like, bro, food is not the enemy. It is never the enemy. When it becomes the enemy, you kill yourself slowly because like you don't eat, <laughs> like you need food. Food is a good thing. Maybe don't live off of Twinkies. Like maybe incorporate like an apple or some bananas or like have some Brussels sprouts. But like food is not the enemy. So saying that food has no power over you, I know it's a stupid line to get caught up on, but it bothers me. There was some really fun ones that are kind of repeats throughout this book, but okay, so on page 64. Keep your eyes off my lover spell. If your relationship needs a spell for your partner to not go wandering, it's not a relationship to save, okay? This is again, therapy. <laughs> Work on yourself and figure out why you're wanting to cling to a person who you can't trust to stay with you. And with the research side of my issues on page 87, there's like the Eye of Horus, but it's for a Shinto goddess. So I, d I tried to Google it to see if it was even like a similar style or something, but no, like it is just poor design perhaps. Maybe it wasn't the author, but the editor, but yeah, someone dropped the ball because the Eye of Horus, is not Shinto. On page 88, we have enchantment for youthfulness, and it's a polite way of body shaming you. Again, the author's issues are like so apparent. Youthfulness does not need to be on a pedestal. And especially for witches and like pagans in general, we're very pro getting old. <laughs> like it's a thing that like not everyone is graced with. And yet somehow for some reason this book is clinging like we're back in the 1940s to this idea that it really seems aimed at women, I'm gonna be honest, of what you're supposed to want, which is youthfulness and a slim body. And you're like, or embrace the wrinkles and embrace it because like youthfulness is fleeting and it's kind of creepy if you think about why you're wanting to look so much younger than your age. Embrace your age, it's fine. Like, it's just these random shadows that she's like trying to push onto people of like, well, you look old. And it's like, yeah, it's a good thing. I'm still alive. And like, to be honest, we can change the narrative of what age looks like. Because like, for me, I thought like 27, I would look a lot different and be like way more put together and I'm not, and you know what? That's what 27 looks like for me. There are people that are in like their 80s that are dressing in like the most outlandish, amazing, like rainbowed outfits. They're like wearing every single color, vibrant, and they're, they got wild, crazy hair, and I love it. And they're living their best lives, and that's what like 83 looks like to them. So then we also have like little things that again, knowing my audience, I pay attention. So. Just as a heads up, if you are not a straight couple, probably not for you. There's a lot of like really pushing the narrative of like heterosexual specific relationships. If that's what you got, cool. If not, it, you're gonna have to do some adjusting. Then we've got page 105, get my ex back spell. And she starts the book off with that kind of a spell. I think it was actually the same one that she talked about. But yeah, if your ex is gone, let them go. Again, most of this book really could just be summarized as please get therapy <laughs> because don't cling to your ex. If they are your ex, don't be doing magic to take away their consent. Because again, consent is key. Don't take away their consent to the relationship because you're lonely. Do work on yourself to figure out why you are clinging to a person that the relationship didn't work go figure it out in therapy, do your shadow work, do some inner work, don't encourage spells to go get your ex back. It reads like it's a book for teenagers, to be honest, because what a teen girl's worried about specifically? Weight, youthfulness, which is weird if you think about it, but yes, a lot of teen girls, and I think it's only gotten worse since I was a teenager, because it was, it was a thing, but now that I like, you get to see the comparison of like when you were a teenager to like teens now, and you're like, 
You have more of a makeup and skin routine than I do. And I'm double your age. Cool. Like, they have a lot of pressure to have a specific look that is, it's just, it's insane. But also, it's going to be teen girls that are like, but my ex, it still happens as adults, but let's be honest, teenagers and the angst is real. And the like, what's my love? It's, it's a lot stronger as a teenager. And then you become an adult and it lessens a little bit when you're like responsibilities and shit. And like, wow, maybe that person wasn't good for me. And like therapy. I know it's a lot of the message of this video, but like seriously. And then on page 12, continuing the message, new moon spell to ignite passion in someone's heart. Again, my note is literally consent. Who's she? Because consent's not in the room, that's for sure. This next one is one that like, I'm not sure if it's just a me thing, but to me it didn't seem right from what I know. So on page 142, there's an enchantment to sell your ideas. It has a lot to do with the rooms. And in particular, I feel like it wasn't researched terribly well. So she's listing off all of these runes to use. And one of them is, and I, I know I mispronounced them, the horrors. Again, that community is my favorite. It looks like Hagalaz. That's how I've heard it pronounced. I'm sure it's wrong. We're embracing that I cannot say words that I don't know the language. Anyways, it's the H rune. And it's supposed to be to activate your spell. That feels a little weird. Cause that's like one of the more negative runes. It's not a, it's not a good rune. It's I re, like that. There's like a little section of like three in particular, back to back that are not great. That one's one of them. That's typically like to halt things, and it's not a good one. It's hail. Hail is not great to activate things. It breaks things. It freezes things. So I'm not sure why it was used as an activation for the spell, but like whatever and then like some of the rune like it's it was also listed as the rune of hardships so i feel like that's not great let's activate through hardship mm -hmm. that's a great option so we have 169 enchantment to seduce for the following week you will be able to seduce anyone you choose and my immediately thought was just like, is this a like roofy version of a spell? Cause that's what it's feeling like, doesn't it? Where it's like, well, I get to choose whoever I want to do because I did this spell. You have no consent in the matter. It's all about me. It just, it was giving that vibe to me. A little bit of an extreme, but also the premise. If you take magic that it's going to work and then you're like, mm, well, I can do whoever I want and I can seduce whoever I want. Like you're taking consent out of the picture. It's not okay. And again, there's a lot of these. The author at one point, I finally was just like, I think you were just horny when you were writing this book, to be honest. Because we've got 176, to stir love into someone's heart. Consent, who's she? 178, spell to seduce. Again, consent. Uh, spell to empower you with passion. Again, girl. They sell like things that you can buy even at like Walmart to fix your need, okay? You don't need to be getting other people involved. You can do it all by yourself and not have to take consent away from anybody. It's an option. This next one is one that I just felt like other people had talked about and I agree. And like I could not find anything to support what the author says. And with no bibliography, I think she's just pulling things. So on page 190, she goes back to the Norse. We have Frigga, also known as Frigg. I call her Frigg. But anyways, was known to carry a box of secret potions that turned ugly mortals into beautiful nymphs. And I'm like, no, just no. Nymphs weren't really a thing in the Norse. And the Norse didn't really do a lot with mortals. It was kind of more of a Greek thing. Same with nymphs. So, and like the way she described Frigg makes me question if she is one of the people that puts Frigg and Freya as the same. Because in that case, like maybe, but still not the nymph part. But like, she's putting her in this role of like the seductress kind of a deal. Not necessarily what Frigg's typically associated with. That's usually Freya's job. <laughs> and I'm still team they're separate, but the author doesn't specify that, which again, it's just one of those like nuances that it's like, where, where did you get the research? I'm really curious. Who's saying that Frigg is turning ugly mortals into nymphs? Ain't never found that one yet. So in all the discussions that tends to be not for the 
anything Norse. And then lastly, on page 194, there is a charm to keep a lover from straying. And again, my note is just, girl, get therapy. <laughs> if you're so worried that your partner is going to stray, you need therapy. You need to work on why you are so concerned and have so little trust in your partner. And if your relationship is built on no trust, that's not a relationship to keep. Be happy on your own, build up your own self-esteem, and then find a person that you can trust. Not taking away consent because you decided to date somebody who doesn't have morals that align with you. That's a you problem. And then again, I've mentioned this, there's no sources and the epilogue was a really weird poem that like, I don't know what that conclusion was supposed to be. It was there, but it didn't do anything. It didn't add anything to the conversation. It was really, really random. So needless to say, I did not enjoy this book. <laughs> it was a hot mess through and through. The only reason it's, it's not the worst I've ever read. It's just, it's not great either. So anyways, the moral of this book consent is key it doesn't matter where in life you are consent always get that that's a good thing uh, especially in relationships always make sure everyone's on board including your magic that's a thing that you should do so anyways moral of the story i didn't like this book i would love to know your thoughts in the comments down below a huge thank you to my patrons if you want to support me and get access to exclusive content it is patreon.com slash nightwillowcrafts make sure to like and subscribe i post every single day and until next time thank you so much for watching and bless be.